Hi. Um, so please join me right now in welcoming Sophia. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brandy. I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really um, excited to be here. Really was very uh, appreciative of Catherine's uh, mindfulness moment. I needed that this morning, so that was perfectly right on time. Um, and today, as uh, Brandy said, I really uh, want to share with you all just uh, my insights from my journey. Um, as Brandy said, my background is really um, in organizational development or capacity building. It's the same same term; they're interchangeable. Um, and human capital strategy, and really uh, operationalizing DI. I spent um, over a decade uh, working in that space, trying to implement and create initiatives that would foster equity and inclusion. So I bring that fusion um, to the work that I'm doing now. Um, and it's really for me about centering people in the process. And I know for um, organizations that you all represent, uh, you, are, you are out, you have these wonderful missions. So it's really sort of looking at that sort of operations, that internal component um, of your strategy to, to see how your people, uh, the people that, that actually do the work to fulfill your mission um, are being uh, sort of uh, feeling equitable and inclusive in their space. So we're gonna get started and I'm just excited to be here. So I should be able to share my screen. So let me try doing that. <laughs> and my new name is Screen Queen because thanks to COVID, I've got all these different screens going. So hopefully y'all are looking at a PowerPoint and not my uh, shopping cart for some Amazon thing I'm trying that should not be purchasing. So. All right, so you already know who I am. We've talked about that. Every time I start to talk about DI, I always come back to Mother Maya and this idea of um, the tapestry, right? And that, you know, beyond what we see when we, when we look at people, that there are all of these sort of rich um, experiences and nuances and expertise and uh, stories that we bring into the space. And so the idea is, is we sort of have this, um, for me, what feels like a uh, resurgence of energy and excitement um, around this conversation of equity um, and inclusion uh, that, you know, we have to really be thinking beyond uh, just what we perceive and just knowing that everybody has some value to bring regardless of sort of who they are. And that, you know, sort of, sort of deconstructing a lot of these uh, concepts um, that we've normalized, um, especially me. I, I mean, I was raised and socialized and educated in this country. So even sort of deprogramming um, some of my own thinking and really sort of getting um, beneath those layers. So I uh, was like the sort of mother Maya. This is like one of my quotes I love. And the other one is, you know, you can't change something, change your attitude, which is very much reflective of, of sort of how I try to function um, when I go out and do this work is to just be open-minded, which I saw a lot of people put in the chat um, as something that they want to bring to today. So, all right. So um, as Brandy said today, we're really going to talk about why. I always have to start with uh, why we're even talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, why this is important. Um, I'm going to share with you the framework that I use to um, really, uh, as I said, operationalize and create that roadmap that organizations need to, to start putting these uh, initiatives and programs into practice. The leadership imperative, I'm going to spend a little time talking about that because that is uh, a very critical component. And then, as I said, I'll get into this concept of really operationalizing DEI. And what I always tell folks to, as we start these conversations is, um, you know, you got to think about the components that make sense for you. Um, and the work I do is very customized. I don't cookie cutter. Um, this is a framework that I'm using in this particular space when I do DEI work. But as I start working with clients and start talking about this, everybody's in a different place in their journey. Some people haven't started their journey. So to me, again, it's sort of this place um, to start the conversation. And, I, and one of my favorite things that I say, and, and I hold true as one of my values is, I don't know what I don't know. So I come into every um, situation really just sharing what I know and being prepared to actively listen and learn um, what I don't know. So, all right, so let's start with, um, just how I start to think about or even talk about uh, why DEI. And there's usually four, um, what I say, cases or, or um, sort of mindsets that you can think about. And the first uh, one, and these are in no particular order, but the first one I would start with is really this idea of the moral or social justice case, which I think is sometimes where 
um, people first come to this, right? Is, you know, each person has a value to contribute, like Mother Mind's quote, and that, you know, we must address these barriers and historical factors that have led to unfair conditions for marginalized populations. So that's the moral or social justice case. And there's obviously um, a lot of value in that. The other um, piece that I always talk about is this idea of the economic case, you know, and that organizations that will tap in to their diverse talent pools are just stronger and more efficient. There's a lot of research that supports this. Um, and in fact, the Center for American Progress um, did a workplace discrimination study and found that um, those cases where employees filed either race or gender or sexual orientation uh, discrimination cases, it actually costs an organization an estimated $64 billion annually if that employee decides to sue you or you lose talent, you have turnover, you have gaps in productivity. So it's not a good look financially for your organization, especially um, nonprofits that, that may or may not have large budgets that, that talent retention is so important and not wanting to be dealing with. And imagine if you're like from my HR background, if you're dealing with these types of cases, the work of the organization, the mission of the organization is not getting the full attention that it deserves. Um, the other important case is the market case. And, and again, this really ties into that idea that organizations can better uh, serve their clients uh, fulfill their missions if their workforce reflects uh, the diversity of uh, the market or the constituents that they are trying to, to serve. And, and we know this, we see the demographic shift that's happening um, in our country. So we know that uh, you know things are changing, different needs and issues are arising. And so when, when we look at um, whether it's in the, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, this, this sort of a uh, critical mass of uh, a to culturally diverse, a racially, ethnically diverse um, America is really um, impacting organizations at their, their bottom line. Um, there's also this cancel culture and boycotts, which we saw a lot of um, in the past year. Um, and again, as I said, in the nonprofit sector, you know, uh, you're really sort of understanding the challenges uh, and, and concerns of the, the individuals, the clients, the constituents, the communities you're trying to serve, you know, people want to see those themselves represented in the organizations that serve them and not want to have to explain all of these issues. And, and one of the um, examples that I use is I was working with an organization that's led, um, 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 it's, it's a healthcare organization for uh, trans people and it's led by a trans person. And she wanted to talk to me offline. It's like, I don't want to explain stuff to you. I was like, girl, I got you. I was like, look, I've been, I've had my education. I'm still needing to learn more, but this is what I know about your community. This is what I understand, but I'm open to learning more. And she's like, okay, good. We got it. Because having those conversations, having to explain to somebody that, that this is an issue and they don't get it, it's just, it feels like a non-starter. So really having that, um, that level of, of understanding so we're having a conversation about needs and I'm not explaining to you how we got here is important. And then last but not least, um, there's this uh, concept of the results case. And this is, this is sort of where I live and breathe in, in the sort of capacity building, organizational development as a, as a lifelong student, as a researcher, that diverse teams lead to better outputs, period. Um, again, a lot of research. One of the books that I love is um, by an author, Scott Page. Um, it's called The Difference and How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Society. And, you know, thank goodness for him because I'm not a math major. <laughs> I'm an uh, OD person. So, you know, he uses a mathematical model and case studies to show how diversity leads to increased productivity. And his research found that diverse groups of problem solvers outperform the groups of the best individuals at solving problems. So again, you get the people in the room, you get uh, some open-minded thinking, dynamic exchanges of, of ideas, and you will be able to solve uh, social problems, the problems of our society. Right. So that's, that's the why. And I always say that, you know, I, all of those are important. That's what I'm like, there are no particular order, but as you start thinking about this, as an organization, if you're trying to have a conversation or a dialogue, whether with um, you know, members of your organization, your board, potential donors that, that just aren't there yet, these are some um, potential 
uh, cases that you could bring up and, and everybody is coming at it from a different place. I kind of alluded to this already. There are uh, you know, tons of overarching benefits that lead to integrating um, these concepts um, into your organization. And there's uh, you know, tons of data uh, that supports this. Lots of reports by McKinsey and company, Deloitte, um, that have done all this research look at um, companies and they found that when you know companies in the so that are found that those in the, in the top quartile for ethnic and racial diversity in management was 35 percent more likely to have um, the returns um, above their industry means so there is a lot of research and there are these benefits so before um, we get too deep into this I do want to just do a quick pulse check on where, where are y'all um, and what is happening in your organizations? And I, I think, uh, Brandy, uh, I don't know if it's you or Molly's gonna throw up a poll um, and we wanna know what is, oh yeah, there it is, hey. Um, you know, what's happening? Are you, um, is this on your radar, not on your radar? Is this a new or emerging initiative? Or for your organization, is, is this an ongoing journey that uh, the, the marker for me is, you know, May, 2020? right um you know is this been happening and and as we get into this we're, we're going to talk a little bit more too about um yay all right we got 27 more seconds on the poll this is looking good actually my math is wrong it's counting up not counting down <laughs> so now we have 20 more it's like a one minute poll we've got 24 seconds okay this is good. Well, so far, uh, no one has has checked the not on our radar. So that's good news. Everybody's thinking about this. Awesome. All right. We're counting it down. All right. Okay, cool. So there we go. So definitely, we're kind of, you know, very close here. Uh, new or emerging, and then, you know, something that's been ongoing for since 2020, so that's good. Oh, can you, do I have to show results? It's good, okay, because it says show results. I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing that. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll stop sharing that. All right, cool, so let's get into this um, conversation around what I call moving from insight to action. So I'm gonna get this slide going, sorry about that, hold on, okay. And so one of the things that I've been saying is, you know, and where, where I started to really think about the framework is this idea of moving from insight to action. And, you know, what we, what I observed, as I said, the marker for me was, um, you know, May of 2020, you know, there was a lot of, um, obviously, and it was a very illustrative year for, for, for the world, I would think, just on a, a couple of different levels. Um, but I feel like for the first time, and, and I, somebody I know said this, and I'm going to quote uh, Tonya Wellens here, that you know we had a lethargic nation that was held captive in a moment to watch some some really horrible things unfolding for people in our country, men of color. Um, we saw a lot of racial inequities. We saw economic inequities, healthcare inequities, educational inequities, because we were all sort of sitting at home, um, looking at this crisis unfold in the world. And what I saw happening sort of simultaneously with there were these sort of very lofty statements that came from organizational leaders across um, a, a, a sectors and industries. And um, I don't know about y'all, but a lot of my friends were like, oh, okay, th this is it. This is what they're doing. We, we have all these statements. So um, one of the things being a results oriented person, I'm like, okay, what can I do? in the work um, with my clients it calls to me to go beyond what I call um, feelings of sort of outrage and frustration and move to actual action. So we have a uh, movement and not a moment. And what I know sometimes when you talk about change or initiatives or how you really sort of bring things to fruition, um, it can be daunting. It can feel uh, frustrating if you don't have a plan, if you don't know uh, the actual steps that you need to take. And so when I started you know, thinking about that and thinking about the, the work that I've done in the past, I pulled together this framework to really, as I say, operationalize diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so again, this is, this is my plan 
for moving from insight to action. And so really looking at the organizational components, how you, uh, that sort of operations piece of how you do capacity in your organization to create change in your organization, because we are not changing 400 years of legislation in America. That's not happening overnight, but we can create sustainable change in our organizations today. I can make decisions as a leader in my organization to make sure that people are treated right, to make sure that I provide opportunities for growth and development to the, to the next generation, and that I can mentor and coach and just do what I can in my community and in the work that I do to create an impact. So these are the components, and as I said, they're, they're by no need, means exhausted, but it does strive to align DEI with your organizational systems and processes. So you can, as people like to say, walk the, the talk, right? So these are the components. Um, and you know, obviously the first one is what's anything that you're doing with your organization, what is your plan? Why are you doing this? What is the value proposition? So we're talking about strategy. What are we even talking about you know, as in terms of defining terms, what's our lexicon, right? How are we communicating this? How are we measuring impact? And how does this make us better? How does having a DEI initiative help us uh, achieve our mission? The leadership commitment is, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but there's nothing happening without leaders. And there's leaders at multiple levels of the organization. So I always say it's, it's top down, bottom up, middle out. So everybody, um, has to be modeling and on board and and holding uh, accountability um, and grace, frankly, in this space. And then we talk about recruitment, whether that's recruitment for your internal staff or for your board, right? How, who is at the table? How are we um, creating opportunities to connect with, with the folks that we need in our workforce? And how do we move beyond our sort of traditional uh, and again, every organization is different, but we typically do about recruiting and attracting talent or board members to, to really dive in and sort of engage with those communities that we want um, to engage with. We have inclusive performance management, which is the experience um, people have. How are they cultivated? How are they given feedback? How are they given opportunities? Um, how are they coached and developed along their journey, professional career journey within your organization? And then the concept of culture, um, behaviors, values, and norms. How do we show up? And, I, and we're talking about lived culture, not people say, oh, we're welcome, we're open, we're, we're joyful, but what is the actual experience that people are having once they come into your workplace? And the leadership or and the culture or are linked intentionally because we always can measure an organization's culture by the worst behavior the leader will tolerate. So that's, that's why the leadership imperative is so critical. And last but not least, we have the marketplace community impact. And, and what is your value proposition? If you're an organization that, that has a lot of vendors, that you know engages uh, and and you know hires uh, you know contractors, what does that demographic look like? Are you making an intention to use um, diverse suppliers or minority business enterprises? Are you creating pipeline for the future? Are there some community involvement things you could be doing? Again, it, it varies for every organization, but these are some things that you can think about. This is the roadmap. This is the framework. And again, the work that I do really customizes the components of this based on where the organization is in their journey, right? So let's get into um, what I believe is the linchpin of all of this, which is the leadership imperative. And it is the most critical component. And when I talk about leadership, I think of leadership is a process. And there are three things that I say about leadership. You're leading the self, you're leading others, and you're leading the organization. So within that context, we as leaders, we need to be on our own journey. And trust me, I'm on a journey as well. And I'm, like I said, educating myself, learning. Um, so you've got to do your individual work. You've got to evaluate your own thinking. You have to define what your role is in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion for your organization. Um, and as I said, you have to, and how are you educating yourself on these topics? I attend workshops. I read books. Uh, I, I consider myself a lifelong learner. So I'm always looking for opportunities to so as I said, uh, learn what I don't know, um, you know, and leaders, as leaders, we need to consider this concept of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion as, as any potential threat to our organization and its mission, whether it's uh, financial, you know, getting the funding and resources that we need to execute our mission, whether there's 
competitors, whether uh, we're behind in our technology advancements. Um, and for leaders, it, you gotta get comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is not easy work. And I tell folks that all the time, you start wading into these waters and saying, oh, we're gonna be more equitable and inclusive, then you gotta be prepared that, and I see it happen all the time, that you're not, it's not all good. And you're not, not that you are intentionally, and maybe sometimes you are, but they're subconscious or conscious or um, intentional. There are things that are not working well for everyone in your organization. You just gotta get comfortable with that and figure out how you fix it. Um, and so once you sort of, as I say, get yourself together, um, then it's followed by, uh, you know, your organizational work, right? Inspiring and motivating your role model or champion in your organization. Uh, you're making sure that you are providing the right resources. Um, you're acknowledging new perspectives and allowing people um, to, to bring new ideas, not dismissing ideas um, out of hand. So there's a lot of work um, that goes into this and definitely, um, you know, just creating that space um, and delegating some things. And it, sometimes as, as leaders, we're like, oh, well, I started it and I know what it is. And I, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done right. But that's, again, sort of stepping back and creating space for new and different ideas and approaches. Um, and then the other piece of this is when you are leading others, it's you got to be able and ready to hold um, others accountable. And you know, a lot of what I hear sometimes is, oh, well, you know, Swathia, she was with me the whole time. And it wouldn't be this, I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for Swathia. But if Swathia is a racist and offending people, then you need to shut her down. You need to rethink that. You need to, to pull me aside, especially if we have a relationship we've known for a long time, there should be trust and you should be willing to hold me accountable for the values of the organization. And that's where it gets critical. Right. So I have some tips that I always try to give um, leaders. And again, I talk about this concept of sort of embracing your own um, individual journey. Um, this idea of fostering a climate of psychological safety. And um, this is a concept that we work a lot with. Uh, and it really just is like, I should be able to just show up as myself without fear of negative consequences or self image status or career. Um, and it really sort of like really ties into that culture piece is that the team feels safe to take risks, to take an interpersonal risk, to, to, to say that I'm not okay, or to say that I don't know or understand, and that I, as maybe the only woman on the team or the only trans person on the team or the only LGBTQ person on the team, does not have to assimilate or mirror uh, the dominant majority behavior to, to fit in. To, to feel like I gotta have a job so I can pay my bills, right? So again, it's sort of creating um, this climate of psychological safety, which, which takes work. Um, you definitely have to build trust. Trust is the foundation in any um, personal or working relationship. Um, so demonstrating respect to everyone, being fair, righting wrongs, and, and this idea of transparency, communicating, communicating often, um, communicating mistakes, being vulnerable yourself, um, doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that, and I know that, trust me, I've had to deprogram myself um, to be able to say, I don't understand that. What does that mean? Instead of behind the scenes, I'm trying to look it up and do all this research and thank God for the internet because back in the day, if you couldn't find a library, you were not finding, um, you know, quick information. You had to, you know, actually physically go somewhere. It wasn't like at your fingertips. But again, sort of just making it okay um, to be vulnerable and to ask questions. Um, and then just, you know, pushing through that discomfort um, is also very important as well. And the accountability is huge. So if you got bad apples, get them out of the barrel and fix the system. And like I said, the, the no sacred cows that don't, don't excuse me because I've been with you this whole time, really hold me accountable to, to the journey. Just like your, your organization is on a journey and the life cycle of your organization should be changing as your strategy and resources change. Um, how you lead should be evolving and changing as well. Okay, so that's the leadership imperative. And I link that to the culture. So these are the two ors that are connected. Um, and as I said before, behaviors, values, and norms govern the workplace. And it has an impact on all individuals. It, it has an impact on employee morale, their commitment, their productivity, and, and most importantly, their emotional well-being their wellness in the space, you know? And we always talk about um, the lived 
culture versus what's espoused. So not what folks say, but what actually happens. And my experience has taught me, um, and my research in this work has taught me that homogenous cultures can be exclusive and inequitable. And I've seen this on both sides. I've seen predominantly white organizations with all women, um, all white women, and the only people that are happy are the poor people at the top and everybody else is miserable. And I'm like, wow, how is that happening when you should see yourself in the leadership? You should be excited, but if you don't have good culture, if people aren't treating people with that respect and creating that environment for psychological safety, you're not gonna have a good um, experience and people aren't gonna be engaged and productive. And similarly, I had an opportunity to work with um, an all black organization, black led, everybody, everybody had like, Ivy League degrees and they were doing this really great work. Everybody was miserable. And I was like, no, this is like Wakanda. Like, no, this should not be like this. But it came down to how people felt and how people were treated and how the leader was modeling equitable and inclusive behavior. And it wasn't happening. So, you know, accountability comes in all shapes and sizes and it's not uh, any one demographic. So we really need to be uh, thoughtful. And so again, as an organization, Educate the organization, build awareness in your workforce, how people should be communicating, microaggression, bias, allyship, bystander effect, um, cultural uh, sensitivities, you know, anti whatever it is, whatever you figure out that your organization needs um, are and where your journey is, definitely uh, work in that area. Talk to your folks, ask them what they need, listen to what they need. And, and as I said, push through that discomfort because if you hear something you don't like, that doesn't mean you dismiss it out of hand. You figure, okay, how do we deconstruct and, and create something better? So that's your culture. All right. And now I'm going to get into uh, these, the other components of the plan, right, of the framework. So first and foremost, as I said before, um, you know, what is the plan? Why are we doing this? What uh, what needs to happen. And this DEI strategy needs to be integrated into the organization strategy and goals. It should not operate as a separate function um, because I had that job and it wasn't a great job uh, where, where you've got this diversity person and they're sort of on the outside and they're the only person working. This initiative is for everyone in the organization. And that's why we look at changing your systems. So it's integrated and everybody has ownership. So as you think about sort of creating your plan, how does the vision for DEI align with the mission of the organization, right? Um, how are we defining our goals and objectives? What, what are we talking about? What is our lexicon? What are the terms that we're using that's associated with our, our initiative? So whether that's racism, microaggression, inclusion, what are the definitions that we're using? And then much like with probably any other uh, committee or, or body, leadership body that you have in your organization, Who's it, wh where's the governance? Is there, there a, a culture committee or an inclusion committee? Um, and that even creates opportunities for uh, people to develop and, and have leadership opportunities within your organization. Um, and that's not to say that you should just find all the, the people of color or the, the people that identify as, as you know, diverse and put them on a committee, but really it, it belongs to everyone in the organization. And much like with your other strategies, what are the tools that you're gonna to use to measure and evaluate um, your outcomes, right? Um, and so what your goal is, what your benefit is that you're gonna build a vibrant and inclusive climate that draws people together across different backgrounds, experiences and interests. Um, and you're gonna um, ideally expand your capability um, to meet your mission and to serve your, your clients and your, your community. So this is a, you know, Scott Page, this is a win-win for organizations. So as you, as you think about your plan creation or you're even revisiting where you are in your journey, you know, definitely think about um, how you're engaging all the voices in your organization. Uh, you know, definitely be sure to um, allow for, for big picture thinking, uh, be explicit and be flexible. You know, if, if, this, if this is working or things are changing, um, in our community, then, then we need to, to pivot as well. So much like you assess um, any long-term or short-term strategy, again, this should be integrated into all that you do as an organization. And then this concept of, of talent. 
And the main thing that I tell employees, and I, I don't, I, I know some um, organizations are very small, um, but my philosophy is this, whether you're hiring one person or hundred people, you need a plan, have a system or mechanism in place. Um, and recruitment is a cycle that is ongoing. Your brand actually precedes you. And so you're constantly, any conversation, any interaction that you're having, um, you're representing your organization, um, especially if you've got your, your logo in your background, right? So there's a potential opportunity to either find future talent or for that person to connect you um, with, with a talent source. So just definitely be thinking about define um, and think about who you are and who you're trying to hire and why and what that looks like and the value you think that that individual is gonna bring, uh, that expertise is gonna bring to the organization. Cause like mother mine, we don't just want, like just just hire me because, I, because of this. Hire me because I have the, the expertise that I have. I have the education and training that I have. And, I, and I'm gonna bring all of that to your workplace. So, so bring me in and let me do what I know how to do. Um, it's always important um, to really think about your sourcing methods um, and to uh, really kind of look at all of your recruiting materials and sort of audit them um, for equity. So, uh, and you really need to think about your talent pool. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second when I talk about sourcing. Um, but you wanna, like I said, have a plan, uh, you know, put a process in place and hold yourself accountable to that plan. It might feel clunky if you don't normally do, oh, we only hire one person, we need to do it. You've got to get consistent because you want to have every applicant having the same experience. If I refer someone um, and you're like, oh, we're not going to interview Swafi's candidate because we know Swafi is great, but you're going to interview Brandy's candidate, that, that, that's the definition of um, inequitable. So make sure you have a consistent process to, to hold everybody accountable. Um, sourcing is so important. Um, and sourcing, as I said, it's, like it's your brand, your reputation precedes you. Um, so as you start going out um, into the community, who are you creating real relationships with? Um, you make sure all of your job postings um, are inclusive and there are these great resources. Gender Decoder is free. Um, so you can actually drop your job posting into the Gender Decoder and it will actually let you know if your job, this job posting is coded for more male centric or female centric or if there's balance in it. And then obviously there's there's an app for everything. So Talavista and OnGig are also apps that help you. Uh, I don't, I think those you have to pay for though, that you can go in and sort of make sure that you are, that your your language of your job posting is inclusive and not favoring any particular um, person. There's also a lot of different um, tools in the, in the um, sort of arsenal of hiring uh, diverse talent or increasing diversity in your talent pools because uh, the likelihood of a diverse hire actually goes down if the talent pool or the interview pool or the candidate pool doesn't have enough diversity. And there's this awesome uh, research study done by Harvard Business uh, School back in 2016 um, where they noted that when two minorities or women uh, were in the finalist pool, the status quo changed and the likelihood of them getting hired went up. So just something to think about. You've got to start with that sourcing. And like I said, have a plan. So this is a model. Um, so once you have your sourcing uh, technique solid, um, then you really start going through the other phases of this model uh, in terms of how you review resumes. If you think bias is a factor, then consider blind reviews. And there's, there's an app for that as well. Um, and then standardize your interviewing process, creating interview panels is a good idea. And again, creating an evaluation tool so that every candidate, whether they're a board candidate or whether they are being hired into your workforce, uh, it's getting the same experience, the same objective experience. Think about if there are biases in your interview process, everyone should be asking the same questions and people should be having the same experience. So those are some things to think about in terms of your hiring of folks. And then once you get folks in the door, this is another big piece. Um, set them up for success. They've got to be onboarded and integrated. Um, and I know sometimes it's a fire hose, and it's baptism by fire, and things are moving really fast. But there has to be some space and time for people to understand and learn your organization, to have a mentor or a guide, somebody that they can feel safe um, going to and talking to folks um, about what their needs are or what they're experiencing. 
um, and really understanding what your organization is, how your organization operates. So something to think about. And then after you sort of, you know, get your folks in the door and they're having this wonderful experience, the next big piece of this is, you know, um, an inclusive uh, higher, uh, performance management process. So what are, what does your uh, workforce need, right? What's important, I have worked with clients where they're in a couple different places. Some um, have an, an sort of antiquated system because the way we think about inclusive performance management is that we're not rating people. We don't have these arbitrary scales where I look at it and I say, okay, I'm gonna give Swafia a three. We don't do that, right? We really try to create um, goals. We try to make sure everybody understands what the organizational goals are, what the organizational strategy is. Um, and we have ongoing meetings throughout the year. Um, we say quarterly, but I believe it should be more. But we're not just talking about the project, or we're not just talking about your program, but we're talking about you, the individual, and your professional journey and how you're meeting your goals. And one of the, the great things that I always get um, from mentors and guides are the, the things that they see in me that I don't see in myself, the potential that they see or the, the strengths that I have that sometimes, you know, I'm not mindful or, or is self-aware in those moments to realize, oh, wait, I do do that well. Maybe I should think about that some more. So those conversations are important. And, and if you align, like I said, around your goals with the organization's goals, then you have um, this very uh, productive conversations about how people perform. And so I always tell folks, whether you're starting, um, this is where you start and people are uncomfortable not having those rating skills. I don't know why, because I think they're uh, cumbersome and they don't really, of substantiate performance uh, or improve performance in any meaningful way. The score sometimes just stresses people out because people are just thinking about the five and they're not thinking about all the, the different skills and competencies that are just gonna make them a better um, contributor, frankly, um, or better at what they, what they want to do or their passion is to do. Um, and so you definitely wanna be thinking about what your process is, um, audit your existing process, um, think about engage, you know, launching a new process if you don't have one. And trust me, I, I've worked with clients very recently that don't have a process in place. And so we're working um, with them to build that now. Um, and engaging the workforce. What does the workforce need? What does your staff need? And so you're having those conversations and building this collaboratively. Um, and you definitely want to make sure that you are um, just embracing this idea of, of mentoring. You want to be supportive of your, your whoever's um, your managers or supervisors or whatever that hierarchy is um, in the organization has to now do this work if they haven't already been doing it. And again, that's just back to your leadership commitment. What do I need now that I'm being asked or if I've already been um, you know, responsible for somebody's professional development, right? Because it's a big responsibility. And, and you know, what we see and learn is that people have wonderful technical expertise and so they get promoted into these leadership or management roles but they may not have the people uh behavioral skills the competencies to really um help somebody guide uh their career path and so we definitely want to think about that as well so i always give tips as you can see um so just you just really start with goal setting just sort of formalize goal setting implement those quarterly check-ins um and you want to definitely uh, monitor and track just the process and utilization, support your supervisors because they need it. Um, and then really sort of monitor and track how this situation is being utilized. And there's, there's a lot here. So again, think about where your organization is, uh, what your employee needs are, um, and go from there. All right. And last but not least, we have this marketplace and community impact. And again, this is a very um, customizable space. This really talks, speaks to the value proposition of your organization. This for some organizations can be, you know, potentially the most daunting area, but I don't think it has to be. What do you wanna do? How do you wanna show up in the community where you live and work, right? And so this could be anything. This could be supporting diverse vendors. It could be adopting a school, supporting a reading program um, in the community. It could be a pipeline program. It could be a scholarship or mentor program, mentorship program intern programs with the undergrad, grad, it could be anything. Um, it could be volunteerism, uh, although many of you probably wouldn't be volunteers, but you know, um, 
what, what is it that you are trying uh, to accomplish? And where, where would your efforts um, have the most impact? And again, tapping back into your internal workforce, what do they, what do they want? What's going to feed their souls in, in the work that they're doing outside of just meeting the mission? And again, so this is a very sort of interesting and special place for organizations to be in. So I'm going to pause because I want to have, before I get to the last couple of I want to just do a check-in because I know that probably felt like a fire hose, but I did a lot of, of talking and sharing. But I would just, just based on the fact that folks are along a journey and folks are uh, merging into a journey, I just wonder what um, tips or advice do you all have for the group about um, just either starting or maintaining um, an organization's DEI journey, especially that internal journey, because that's what, what we've been talking about. And I'm going to stop sharing and folks can put stuff in the chat. And I see people with raised hands. So I'm going to stop. I only see one person, Brandy, but I see a raised hand from Nina. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Nina, do you want to go ahead and share? Uh, sure. I just want to say that um, sometimes it's like a there is a cool group of the moment, like the diversity efforts are focused at one group, but we should really have a, like a more holistic approach. Like for example, yesterday in the immigrant um, journeys, I do work with a huge Arabic speaking population in ACPS, like over 500 students. So I was just surprised not to hear those stories, but I know the community is there, right? Um, and so it's very important, I think in this journey that we, like the community, when we talk about diversity, it, it really reflects the community that we're talking about, whether it's the Amharic speaking community, the Arabic speaking community. Um, I mean, our community is super diverse, Dari, Pashto speakers. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the data tells us they're there, right? As home language for our students. Um, and just so our actions also need to reflect that diversity and not just like be selective. Although yes, we recognize, you know, the need for anti-racist work that's long overdue by centuries, but mm -hmm. our community is also much more diverse than I think w the data we might have says. Absolutely, Nina, I, I agree with you 100%. And that's why I'm saying as where your community is, where your organization is, these are the conversations that you need to have and, and it needs to hit across uh, demographics as well, because it's different for everyone. Other thoughts? Do you see other raised hands, Brandy, or, there, or should I be looking at the chat in terms of people sharing? I don't see any other raised hands yet. Oh, Joseph Thompson, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry if uh, you've addressed this already. I had to step away for a second. But in the conversation about evaluation, and you were mentioning the number system and how people are so tied to the number system. And one of the things that um, I have observed is that a lot of times there's a sense that that's, that's a very concrete and quantitative way to be tied to your compensation, mm -hmm. potentially, and you know, really understanding where you are in relationship to other people. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you've come across that mindset and how you've dealt with that. Because I can, I mean, it's an understandable sort of mindset around that issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and again, it's sort of that that deprogramming. Because I mean, I'm I'm dating myself, but I, I came into this work in the '90s, in the late '90s, and so that that definitely was the model. Um, and then you would actually have that conversation about your compensation in the middle of your review. So we'd say, forget that, that. do a compensation analysis create some salary bands and, and uh, for the, the job level, for the market, you know, all of that sort of salary analysis work. And it, it is what it is. You know, we, we literally just had this conversation as a, um, as a team because we had uh, a grad student that was working with us in our entry level position. Um, he graduated. Um, he had met all of our uh, performance expectations in terms of his capability and uh, the next tier up was a, a $13,000 job. And they were like, oh, well, isn't that a lot? I said, but if we hired somebody in that position that we don't even know their performance, what would we pay them? So yes, he gets the $13,000 job, right? So really sort of 
again, separating out if the market dictates that this position um, is this is this salary band um, and, and the performance is a performance and they've met all expectations and, and our cycle says that they're eligible for the max maybe 3% or 2%, then it is what it is. Because what does the number really tell us? Like I said, we're moving away from that thinking and the research is telling us that um, those numbers uh, don't really meet, people don't really connect to those numbers. It becomes a very sort of arbitrary evaluation point. And then it gets very subjective because then, it, then we, the, the, the messaging that we heard in the 2000s was um, don't give everybody fives. Everybody can't get all fives you know, because you had the easy grader. So if you take those numbers out and focus on performance and how people are meeting their goals and meeting their expectations or sales targets or whatever that is, right? Fundraising targets or whatever, then you base it on that. And you can't keep moving the needle. Like, oh, they made a lot of money. You know, like you just have to be authentic and true about it. So it, it, it feels radical and people are uncomfortable, but we try, to, we try to phase it in the best we can. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I've been trying to get the salary bands so <laughs> Thank yeah, you, you got, got to start there yeah and that that's a whole nother i mean i, I admire those people it's a little too many numbers for me I'm like, like just give me my final number <laughs> but yeah good luck with that <laughs> um yeah so we have another comment in the chat heather said great point joseph about performance evaluation tools that don't perpetuate biases and white dominant culture but are there any suggestions for racial equity centered performance evaluation resources that you can share yeah, so I don't know about um, racial equity center, but I like I said, the inclusive performance management system is really that everyone uh, has uh, the, the system is set up to have um, in conversations about performance that the goals are agreed upon ahead of time, that there are touch points, that the competencies are defined, and you can't you can't move them in the middle of the, the cycle, right? So the work really starts um, at the front end uh, in terms of Sort of the system that is set up and the expectations that are set up and if people meet um, those expectations then they should be rewarded what but those rewards also should be um, set up ahead of time so like i said the, the model that i'm using is really um, from traditional not traditional but inclusive performance management which is coming from a lot of the research that's being done um, in the ods capacity building space but i haven't seen anything specifically um, for racial equity in my work. But I'm gonna go look now that that's a question. <laughs> so I also <laughs> see um, in the past chats, um, just a lot of conversation around board members mm -hmm. and getting board members on board with this. Mm -hmm. So whether it's they're saying, um, as a way to disengage from DEI conversations or just their maybe fragility around having these conversations, um, maybe if you can talk to Mafia about that, or if other people want to just share kind of their experiences that they've had with board members um, and how to encourage them in this journey. Yeah. D does anybody have some? I mean, I have a couple stories actually, but I'll see. Does anybody want to share? Okay. So I'll start, and then if anybody wants to jump in. So the experience that I've had in working with board members, I actually do a presentation, the board's role in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. It really comes down to power, right? And this idea, again, uh, maintaining the status quo and this idea that, you know, uh, father knows best. Like we know better than anybody how to solve all these problems. And so we have to maintain um, these power dynamics. And so the thing um, that I say is, um, in those sessions is really being thoughtful about the needs of the organization, right? And, and so I had served on a board, I was the governance chair for three years um, of an organization, and we really looked at, um, it was for homeless women, and I, uh, we looked at what are the needs, and, and at different points in, in my time, I was on the board for a total of five years, was a governance chair for three years, we needed different things. When we were trying to buy a building, and renovate a building for the for the organization. We had a huge capital campaign. We needed some of that expertise, and so then when that expertise cycled out, we needed a different type of expertise to come in. But we always tried to balance it. And so what I, what I the question I always get back in that session was like, Are you advocating that we should hold space on the board for certain demographics? I'm like, Absolutely, because how is having an all white male board that's over the age of fifty, not a quota? Why are we so comfortable with that, right? Um, so again, it's sort of what are, you have to center 
the organization's needs and not an individual's desire for power to maintain whatever power that that position gives them, especially on nonprofit boards. You know, it's sort of fascinating to me. I mean, I, I could see on a for-profit board, like you're making money, right? Like there's a, 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 a dividend that you're getting paid. Um, so it, it just becomes fascinating to me. And I think um, you have to approach it the same way and, and you've got to be comfortable um, challenging and they should be on their own journey as well. And, and I, like I said, leading the self, everybody's got to be on their journey and, and be willing to be open-minded um, and listen and, and want to change. So that's my, I don't know if others have thoughts, but that's sort of my experience with boards. I would like to add to that um, some of the boards <clears throat> that have the diversity already, I think they would be good models and we can approach them and ask them like, how did you do it? How did you recruit, recruit the diversity? Because I've been on several boards that started out with just one, um, a, a, one group of people, all men or whatever. And a lot of the corporations refuse to give money to these nonprofits if it's not diverse. And so a lot of the nonprofit organizations are actually getting diversity, good qualified of people who can um, actually sit on these boards. And so the ones who have done that, I think the ones who are attempting to follow suit, we should ask them like, how did you recruit you know, the, di the diverse people on your board? What did you do? Were they, a relationship or a partnership and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, just approach the people who is, whether it's working with them or not. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea too. I love that. Yes. Other thoughts or questions? I think you're getting a lot of love this, yes. <laughs> uh, but people still trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so there, so maybe that's a great segue to my to my next slide. Let me let me let me put that up. And so the the good news is, well, I don't know if it's good news for y'all. <laughs> it's good news because um, I mean, obviously, I, I this is my world. Um, but you know, the next steps I think are really just starting that conversation um, or exploring uh, a little more deeply conversations that you're having, right? And, and to me, there's a couple of things that are really important. Obviously the, the leadership conversations, but even having some round table discussion, listening sessions. A lot of what I do when I first go into an organization is I listen, I ask questions, I probe, what are, what are your needs? How is this important? One of the, the biggest questions that I ask is why? Why, why do you all think this is important? Why is, why is DEI important? And what does equity mean to you? And I always say there is no right or wrong. But when you think about equity and inclusion, how do you how do you think about that for brighter strategies? What does that even mean? And so you start with those conversations, and then you know the other big thing that I do is I look at those internal systems. I look at how um, people are being hired, I look at how people are being trained and developed. I look at um, obviously using my my toolkit, look at culture. Um, and I look at um, I look at, every, at all the documents. Is the other thing too. I'm looking at it for the um, sort of the coded language in the documents or the the you know exclusionary language. I'm looking at processes, talking to leaders. Um, so start start there. Just really start and just be ready, be ready because when you start asking questions, you you may not like what you hear, um, and so be ready. If you're not if you're not really ready, then then don't don't go into this and don't ask questions and then get uncomfortable and shut down, right? Um, so create space, create some rules of engagement of how you're gonna have these conversations. Um, and, and then just do one thing. If it's just one thing, whether that's around education and awareness is always a great place to start if you're not already um, in that sort of active learning space. Uh, just start there, but start with the conversation, start thinking about how this initiative makes your organization better and productive. So, and I think they got the deck or will they get the deck or can I send it? Yeah, so we will have um, a recording um, and we can send the slides as well in the PDF okay. so that people have access to the resources. Okay.
Uh, maybe another question. Um, can you talk about, have you seen organizations engaging their constituents in their DEI journeys and how to bring them into the conversation? Absolutely. I've seen this take a couple different forms, um, whether through town halls, whether through surveys. And again, it's sort of, it happens at, at different phases. So if you're, again, in this sort of exploratory, what we call discovery assessment phase, um, where you're going out and you're saying, here's what we're thinking um, as you know, constituents or, or members or people that we serve in this community, what do you think we should be thinking about? What's important to you? And again, it's sort of distilling all of that down, assessing it and, and you know, almost doing the, 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 the good old SWOT. Okay, we've got all this data. We heard from our internal folks. We've heard from our key stakeholders and constituents. All right, what are, we're doing this well and always lead with strengths because they're, it's not all bad, right? So we always go from it from an appreciative place. What are we doing well? And what's the vision we wanna see for the future? Um, and then where are our opportunities, right? Where do our opportunities really lie? And what's in our capacity to, to, to get to sooner in the short term? And then, you know, building infrastructure and resources or allocating resources for the long term. So it's really sort of thinking about it in that framing. I see Emery has a hand up. If that's yeah, you're mute. You're on mute. The other famous words this year. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I I appreciate the conversation that's going on, and and the thing about it, I heard you say lead with strengths. So obviously, um, I think it's a blessing to be able to have these forums and these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in a place like Alexandria, when you look at the history. And, and one of the things I love about Alexandria is its diversity. Um, I guess for me, it's more the what next. Mm -hmm. We've been having these conversations. We've been having some great conversations mm -hmm. um, and, and we have some great things coming up in the future. And, and just a, a little bit about myself, I work in uh, child welfare, DCHS, um, child welfare family engagement. I'm a fatherhood uh, services coordinator. So I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm blessed to be able to work in the position that I do. Um, but I think where we struggle at is the what next conversation. Okay, we have a fatherhood position, now what? Now, um, it's almost a tendency to say, okay, that's it, we're good now. Um, one of the frustrating things for me, or challenges, I, I should say, for me is uh, how to move forward in that what next conversation. Mm -hmm. we, we have, you know, for our organization specifically, it's not enough male representation. It's not enough black male representation. It's not enough minority male uh, representation. Mm -hmm. And you hear conversations about diversity and how we need to move forward. But um, yet because of that lack of diversity and because I'm quote, the only, I don't want to call myself the only one, but kind of the only one. Um, less, you know, as we move forward, less and less uh, of a male voice, less and less of uh, uh, the diversity of minority male voices um, are coming to the table or coming into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of see that um, mm -hmm. kind of playing out. Um, so that's a few thoughts. I would love to hear some feedback from mm -hmm. you uh, about yeah. Yeah, thank you, Emery, for, for adding your voice to this conversation. I think um, for, for what next for your organization, and, and not this is not to say that, that you should do this yourself, um, but definitely uh, if there is a, a void in Black male voices in your space, then, then y'all need to go out and find those folks, right? And there's a couple different um, avenues to do that. Uh, and again, it, it's sort of this idea of reaching back into those um, communities, because one of the things that, that has fascinated me on my journey is um, the opportunities that exist in this society. And sort of, I said, you know, my background is um, I'm a first generation American. My parents immigrated here uh, from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, we lived in Brooklyn, which I thought was like Trinidad, but apparently it wasn't. And then we relocated um, to, to the West Coast. And my world dramatically changed and then nobody looked like me anymore. Nobody sounded like my parents sounded anymore. But fortunately, because of, 
of education, I was able to get into this world of human resources. And uh, there are all kinds of jobs and opportunities that nobody is telling black and, black and brown kids about. You know, we are pushed, and there's a lot of history around this in this country that I'm not going to debate, but we've been pushed to believe that if you're not an entertainer or an athlete, that there's really no other opportunity for you. So for me, that pipeline is so critical and really getting to those um, young, impressionable minds and telling them that this is, this is something you can do. And so when I got into this HR space, I started interviewing people, I'm like, that's a job? You, you, got, a, that, you got a degree in that? Because this, this was my world based on how I was socialized and based on, on what I saw growing up. So I think it's super critical that if you're missing those voices, because we know from the race to lead uh, research report, the talent is in the workforce. We have to be intentional in our organizational outreach to go out and get it and to inspire and, and motivate this next generation um, that this is an opportunity for them. And I know there's a lot of infrastructure things that come into play in terms of you know, access to education, equity, but that, that's why my work focuses um, on the change that I can make happen. And so that's why I mentor people. I've got a, a group of folks that I mentor um, in a couple of different spaces. And that is my labor of love. That's my, that's my, my other free gigs, because to me, that's important. And anytime I see a group of, of, you know, young men and women that look like me, I'm like, what are you doing? What are you studying? You're so smart. You know, really sort of creating that energy and resources. Uh, you know, I have a fund through the Community Foundation of Washington DC that, that we, my husband and I donate to STEM. We, we formed a robotics team because we don't see enough uh, boys and girls that look like our sons and my nieces and nephews in that space. So that, that's what you would, Emory, that's what I would say, wherever you can reach out and bring somebody in and let them know that this is an opportunity, that this skill that they have to be critical thinkers or, uh, you know, inspire and motivate people, that is a skill that you bring into this work, right? And we, and we don't always make that connection that, that these, um, the ability to, uh, you know, calculate numbers in your head trans, at, at, at 10 translates into being a, a financial analyst, right? We're not getting those messages in school. So to me, that, that's, it feels heavy, but try to reach back in your, uh, through your employer, through your brand to get people into that pipeline. I think that's so important. So that was a long answer, but, he, but your um, comment struck that chord with me. So. I know we're right at time, Brandy. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I feel like we could continue going on. We can't. Um, so thank you, Swathia, for, for sharing your expertise, your energy, your enthusiasm for DEI with us, and just really some practical tools. Um, and just reminding us about the role that each one of us can play as leaders. Um, and I really love what you said, leaders need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, so please join me in thanking Swafia and you can use your reaction buttons to share your appreciation, yay, or your hands. Um, so, okay, so the next thing um, we